On my way to Dan's shop the next morning, I stopped to watch a street performer in the mall. What's peculiar about this man is although he has ripped jeans, a black faded t-shirt with some obscene looking creature on it, long greasy hair and a face full of piercings, he has his violin case open and he's playing Wagner. I watch him as I sip at my flask. The violin doesn't look like an instrument but an extension of him. He moves with it as though it's another limb. Although I could hear an extremely talented young man, what I saw was the hours and dedication it took for him to master his craft and in a sense his own world. In fact, it was more than his own world. It looked like it transcended even him. It was as though he was an extension of the music being played, a vehicle in which he and the violin melded together. He wasn't cognizant of his hands playing. He and the violin were merely a manifestation of the music. In essence, he didn't try to play the music. His hours of mastery had made him become the music. It's midday when I arrive at Dan's shop. It's the earliest I've ever been there, but the store is locked. There's no close sign up either or any indication of how long it would be closed for. I go to get some lunch at a nearby cafe and when I return to the shop an hour later the door's still impenetrable. I peer through the window and see any darkness. Didn't she say she doesn't go outside? I leave again and find a department store where I buy a notebook and a pen and find my way to a cafe in an alfresco piazza. I order a cappuccino and a croissant and sit back, watching the world around me. As the pigeons coo, the maitre d' fusses and the cutlery chinks, I see cups in others nearly as clearly as I imagine they wore a sign above their head that showed their phoenix cup profile. I watch a woman interrogating a man at a nearby table on what looks like a first date, demanding to know his opinion on some personal dilemma. His replies are calm, but his body language betrays him as he leans away from the woman. Her mastery cup is trying to control the conversation, but his dominant freedom cup would likely have not have him return her calls once this date was over. At another table, a man keeps his eyes on his hands and he's fussing with his glass while he continuously talks about his health. His companion leads in expectantly and rarely blinks as she is absorbed by his face. His dominant cup is safety. Hers is connection. I play this game all afternoon. I notice it's not so much the words spoken, but the totality of the behaviours, micro-behaviours, perhaps unde undetectable where I forced to give explanations, but using that innate part of us we sometimes mistakenly refer to as gut feeling, when it's just the entirety of our unconscious analysis.